Welcome to the Cleveland Orchestra's On a Personal Note, where we explore the many ways music shapes our lives. In difficult situations or moments of sheer joy, music connects us with our humanity. My name is Mark Williams. I'm the Chief Artistic Officer of the Cleveland Orchestra, and I have the extraordinary privilege of speaking today with Mitsuko Uchida, one of the world's great pianists and a member of the Cleveland Orchestra family. Hi, Mitsuko. Hi, hi. It's so great to see you and glad to talk to you anyway. I'll see you on the screen only. Thank you so much for making time today. We wanted to talk to you about this extraordinary relationship that you have had with the Cleveland Orchestra for decades. And yeah. even though I've had the pleasure of working with you many times, I actually don't know how this relationship started. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to know the orchestra? Well, actually, I did as a kid when I was, a, I was still a kid and then a student uh, and still half a kid. I bumped into some recordings of uh, Cleveland Orchestra and George Sell. And my record player, well, was an LP player, was a cheapo cheapo, because I couldn't afford otherwise. And I was uh, living in a student hostel. And from the age of 16, I, I, I was in Vienna in a student hostel before I was with the family. And I discovered one day that there was this extraordinary recordings of George Sell and actually, it was uh, the, one of the first that I come across was, was the Brahms Concerto with Leon Fleischer. And then after that, I listened to this and that and various recordings and in even the Mozart Concerto 491 uh, with uh, Casa du Sou, is it possible? I think it probably was. Yeah. And I was, okay, if I may say so, I mean, if the family of Casa du Sou is listening to it, keep your ears closed. But I, uh, he played beautifully, but I thought this is just the most beautiful playing of an orchestra of any Mozart piece. So that happened uh, in when I was a student and youngster and I have been hoping one day to then to be uh, to be meeting this this orchestra until a very good friend of mine called Tom Morris became the executive director. And then one of the first things that he did, I mean, he went from Boston and he, he then invited me to, uh, before he invited me for a concert, he said, why don't you come and listen to this wonderful orchestra? So in between American tours to just visit uh, Cleveland. And I was shown in the old Severance Hall where their library was just there, that little room with the windows looking down on the parking lot. This so, is before the renovation. Exactly. And one of the first things I've done before even going to the concert was, uh, was I wanted to see Zell because they kept all Zell scores there and books. So they, and I said, I want to see the score of 491. I thought how uh, there was a place that I didn't know. How did Zell manage to get that effect 
in that bar. I looked in the part score. It, there was one place with a thin line of pencil line that there was a vertical line. And that made the players play the way that I was shocked to find that anybody made that sort of sound. Yeah. And so, and that was in the Zell score and I never got it, but still it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> so, and then I went to the concert and there were still players that from the olden, olden days and people who were hired by Zell in the fifties. So I had the incredible privilege of playing with, uh, about, you know, who was my great love was a principal second player, Bernie Goldschmidt. And anybody who has known Bernie, he, could, he was one of those people who, played the, who could play the second violin section, like the sound just so beautifully. With uh, every note he played, lived. And I completely fell in love with him. And I went immediately after when, when we were playing together, after the first rehearsal, Bernie, how do you do this? And he was, he actually liked me a lot and we became very good friends. And somehow I, we got an on from the word go. That's something that one hears a lot about the Cleveland Orchestra, this, this musicality, but this inner musicality. It's, I find it very interesting that you would speak about an inner voice and how with this rather bland, I suppose, accompaniment that even there, that they yeah. could make music. Could you, maybe you could tell me a little bit, what are the qualities about the Cleveland Orchestra that keep you coming back here? Well, uh, because it has got this, uh, this uh, complete commitment by the players, what an orchestra should be. And it is possibly with lots of changes and change of membership and all that, what basically is in the core of the Cleveland Orchestra is that one is the Cleveland Orchestra sound, which is transparent. And that was very much so in the string section, that was staggeringly so. And when I started playing, it was as if Zell was still ha hadn't died yet, that sort of sound. Of course, uh, uh, an orchestra changes, but still there is the, the commitment that we, the Cleveland Orchestra, shouldn't do something uh, uh, banal or something. Uh, so there is a, a commitment. I can't uh, describe it otherwise. I'm very curious to hear about your debut with the orchestra, uh, a, an orchestra that you'd known from recording from so many years. Yeah and Tom Morris introducing you with just, just hearing the orchestra. What was it like to finally play with this group of musicians? I loved it. And there were always, when I play with an orchestra, I listen to, I try to figure out what they are thinking. The principal players, well, they stand out, of course. I know exactly, I, I want to know how they function, who is how, but, uh, but also there were some fantastically uh, wonderful players who would, on their own right of being a fa fabulous player, for example, wind, wind section uh, principal players, but then how they played as an ensemble. That was something so wonderful. I think one of the first, I played the C major concerto 467 in Blossom, but in the Severance, it was a Schoenberg concerto. If my memory doesn't fail me, I ought to have been that. And then we did come to Europe and, uh, and we did play a concert in the Carnegie as well. And was this with Christoph von Dagnani? Yes, it was with Christoph, yeah. I, I don't think he liked that piece, but it does, that's besides the point. <laughs> the Schoenberg. Yes.
You know, Mitsuko, when I think back on, I'll insert myself here a little bit. I remember I went to the Institute of Music and so I, I heard many performances with you when I was in, in school. But the one performance that really sticks out for me was hearing you play Schoenberg solo piano pieces on the first half and on the second half playing Piero Luner with the members oh, of the orchestra. Oh no, really? Oh, that was a difficult concert. I cannot tell you how bloody hard that was. Yeah, it okay. It was extraordinary. Okay. I was on the third row and yeah. I I think I sort of fell in love with you and Schoenberg and Piero, Le, Piero Luner all in, in one evening. But I'm curious, it, you've, you've played with the orchestra so many times. Is there... Is there a particular performance of a certain piece that stands out to you? Well, um, I mean, there are some Mozart concerti that I did during the course of the years when I was doing them complete. And I, it is very difficult to, to single out, but then some of them, when we started to record them, uh, um, there are moments of, for example, after the cadenza in, of the first movement of the, the C minor concerto, 491, that general sounds that we got that is uh, that the bleakness of the sound that we, we, we created. I f still remember. And that is on the recording, which is very nice to know. And, and that, that, is, that is this unbelievable bleak, bleak sound of the flute. And the, everybody else is just as if they were whispering. And that I still remember very well. And, and then uh, then one of the four, six, sevens ones in, uh, that we did at some point and so on. So there are many, many. You know, Mitsuko, I, I frequently think that the Cleveland Orchestra wouldn't be the Cleveland Orchestra without this incredible audience that we that we play for. Could you could you tell me a little bit about your connection with the audience here? I mean, they know you so well, at least musically, having having heard you for so many years. And I'm just curious to know what it feels like to have that relationship with an audience from the side of a performer. Well, actually, I have been very lucky with many places. Every place, every city, every great city with uh, some tradition. I have a fantastic relationship with my public in, in the Carnegie. I have, but I have also a totally different relationship to the Cleveland public, which is somewhat more quiet and more, how shall I describe it, personal. And I have the feeling that over the years, they somehow discovered that this pe peculiar person who comes out and plays the piano actually loves the, uh, the, the orchestra and loves that hall. And they know it. And I really love Cleveland. You know, Mitsuko, we, we always talk about you being a member of the family, but we also have a family member in common who is Pierre Boulez. Absolutely, who yeah. was just a, a long a long-standing musical partner of the orchestra. And I know that you and Pierre had a deep relationship, both inside and outside of Cleveland. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yes, actually, it was one of the most wonderful relationships I have had with, uh, with conductors. But Pierre, over the years, I was thinking actually on, the, on the yesterday, how long was our relationship? And because I happen to have been the last soloist, official soloist of Pierre in Salzburg at the Mozartwoche. And guess what? Schoenberg Concerto and Mozart 459. And he was then very unwell and he saw so badly. So it was a rather poignant event. But until then, we played several times and even in Paris, in Cleveland, primarily newer music, but also Alban Berg Chamber Concerto. That, that was an experience for me to do it with, with Pierre and his little group called uh, Ensemble Intercontemporain. And when, once I was asked to do it, I thought, okay, wonderful. And it is just so difficult. 
but I didn't want to be meeting、uh, Pierre at the at the at the concert or at the first rehearsal. So I asked whether I could possibly visit him in Ban Ban, where he lived, and he said, "Of course, yes." And so I went to and spent a full day with Pierre, going through the score, and it was、uh, such a revelation. Pierre was always very kind to me, and I ne- never knew why. But he was really very kind to me, and I re- really loved and admired him. But then he came out with his score in nineteen forty six or seven when he bought that one. He couldn't get、uh, lay his hands on a full score of Alban Berg's Chamber Concerto, so he got hold of the piano sc- reduction score. And you don't know how tiny his handwriting was, but in 1940, whatever, it was even smaller, and it was full of pencil markings everywhere. And we went,、uh, we went through the whole thing. And but slowly, slowly, when it was unfolding, I asked Pierre at some point, "Excuse me, Pierre, you have got all these markings in in, in the score. That is so tiny. Can you read them really?" And he said. No, <laughs> and he said not anymore. Then I did, but not anymore. But then his eyes were still very good. So, but I couldn't because it was so tiny and it was so. Fil- he said that way he studied that piece, and that tells you that the nature of of Boulez. And he apparently loved that piece so much, and he、uh, tried to,、uh, to perform them several times, many many times in his life, and recorded them also、uh, several times. And he wanted to do it for the last time. So, would you do it? That was the, the question that I received, and of course, I jumped and said yes. So, Mitsuko, you started your relationship with the Cleveland Orchestra,、uh, working with Christophe Dacnani, and of course, you've worked with Pierre Boulez with the orchestra. Could you tell me what it's?、Um, What your working relationship has been like working with Franz? I always enjoy Franz working with Franz because he's somebody so special. I think there was、uh, in in our working relationship there was,、uh, for example, one fight line five that was so staggeringly beautiful. And then the, the most recent one, Bartok Three, that was a lot of fun. That I thought nobody ever could conduct as Franz did that piece, and I don't know why nor how, but he it, there was such clarity and beauty, and lots of a lot of other things. And Beethoven Four, I love playing with Franz very very much. So Mitsuko,、uh, I'm curious to jump from your being a soloist with the orchestra, with a conductor, to this move to become the conductor and the soloist. And I, I, I'm curious to know what inspired that change. Well, that happened completely unexpected circumstances in London in the very early 1980s. One day, I received a request. Would I play direct two Mozart concertos for a concert? And I said, "Well, if they they are willing to to risk it, okay, I might do it." And they said, "Yes, please." And then we did it. Somehow we never looked back after that. With Cleveland, I ended up playing all the concerti. What happens when you, as a soloist, when you are making music with the musicians and conducting as well, versus what happens when you are just soloist and there's a conductor? What is that special alchemy? How is it? How is it different? Well, 
first of all, it is not only me, it is the orchestra who hasn't got a hand waving in front of them. Not only the hand, the stick moving in front, in front of their faces. Now, that means that, of course, they have to play with the eyes, but, but they have to use their ears much more than otherwise. If there's a conductor and there's a stick, then you can follow. Yeah? And Cleveland Orchestra is such an amazing ensemble. Uh, they are ensemble players, so they always get together. But if the stick is not there, no, the hand, and the, a lot of the time the hands are on the keyboards, and it's the face plus this and that. So the player's situation changes. And they play much more closely to me. They play as if they were part of me. And I can play also as if I was part of them. Mitsuko, you could have recorded the Mozart Concerti with anyone, but you chose Cleveland. Because I loved their play, and because I, there were also with many, uh, in many cases, that I even chose the pieces according to some certain trait of the, the players. Um, uh, for example, when I was talking about 491, that place, I still remember very well. It's because it was the way Josh could sound so bleak, <laughs> you know, and I wanted that type of sound. So I knew the player so well, and I love the spirit of the ensemble of this orchestra. But also I learned to play with a symphony orchestra directing, actually working with a Cleveland orchestra, because I talked as if a Cleveland orchestra was a chamber orchestra, because it's a small, small group. But a symphony orchestra is a symphony orchestra. They are expecting you to behave in a particular way, as if you were a conductor. And there is particularly when you conduct, yeah? And because there are some parts that I have to conduct. So therefore, I learned the hard way, or that they had to learn the hard way of putting up with me, but also I learned how to show a symphony orchestra players, what I wanted. And that I learned really working with the Clifford Orchestra. And did I love it? Yes, I did. I feel absolutely part of the family of the Cleveland. But I simply, I am just hoping that the next project is absolutely happening and I can't wait to be, to be there. To, and next time is Franz Fitz Schoenberg. Mark, that's correct, right? That is correct. Yes. Okay. And I can't wait to be doing it with, with Franz. And I can't wait to be back in Cleveland and to be walking into Severance Hall. Mitsuko, thank you so much. This was a treat, a real treat for, for me to get to speak with you. I hope to see you very soon. That was Mitsuko Uchida sharing a few of the many standout performances and recordings she's done with the Cleveland Orchestra over the past few decades. Mitsuko is not only one of the greatest pianists of our time, she's family. And you'll have the opportunity to listen to the first movement of Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 24 coming up next. If you enjoyed this episode of On a Personal Note, you can find more at clevelandorchestra.com slash podcast.